All right, guys. Sean O'Malley soundly defeated Marlon Vera in the main event at UFC 299 this past Saturday night. In the process of defending his title for the first time, he also erased his only professional loss. We're looking at quite an impressive resume here for the 29-year-old as he stands at 18-1 and 1. That one being a no contest at the very end. I want to see what you guys think of the guy's future and if he can be one of the all-time greats at Bantamweight. That's what we do, right? Someone wins a title, we start wondering what's the future for them. So can he be the best ever? He'd have to eclipse Aljamain Stewart and Dominic Cruz's record, UFC record, of three title defenses. I also want to point out Dominic Cruz had two title defenses at WEC where most of the basically best lightweight uh, class fighters were housed before the UFC absorbed them. So maybe keep that in mind. All right, guys, can you be one of the greatest ever? Yay or nay? We go to Nolan King for the first take. Well, coming out of that performance, I mean, Sean O'Malley once again showed a great rate of improvement, um, something we've seen pretty consistently from his time on The Ultimate Fighter when uh, Snoop Dogg was yelling O'Malley into the microphone. He has come so far over that period of time. He has proved so many people wrong in these performances uh, as of late. I mean, remember when he got matched up with Peter Yan a few years ago and everybody was saying that the UFC was fast-tracking him and that he had no business being in the, the cage with Yan and that he hadn't earned it? Then he goes out there and he wins a close you know, split decision and then he gets matched up with Aljamain Sterling, a guy he called the most difficult uh, stylistic matchup in the division for him. He goes out there and beats Aljo and then on Saturday night, he goes out there and has an absolutely clinical performance against Marlon Chito Vera. So um, I definitely feel like a fool for ever doubting the guy in the small periods of time where I did. So I, I really don't want to say that he can't do this. But if you look at some of the matchups that are in this division right now, I do think that they prove to be extremely difficult for him. If we're talking about Marab, if we're talking about, um, you know, Corey Sandhag and Umar Namagomedov, these are guys that I think are very tricky. And as we've seen, as the sport has progressed, it is very difficult for champions to hold their titles um, for a significant period of time. I mean, that, that the era where there was Dom Cruz and Jose Aldo and those and Anderson Silva holding the belts for title defense after title defense after title defense, we don't really see that anymore. So um, as much as I'm a believer in Sean O'Malley, as much as I think that he is truly elite and, and could very well establish himself as one of the best Bantamweights ever, I'm not quite sure that the, uh, the the next matchup that's waiting around the corner in Marab Devalishvili allows him um, to, at least in, in in this title reign, hit that mark that you were just asking about, George. Um, but again, not taking anything away from Sean, because that was just a tremendous uh, performance on Saturday night. You ain't lying, Nolan. For 25 minutes, this guy did not take his foot off the gas pedal. That's what impressed me the most. Um, goes man, what do you think? Just like what Nolan was saying, taking us back to that old, uh, sweaty and hot, tough gym in Las Vegas for the swanky apex. We were there when O'Malley was there, and we were thinking, Look at this guy, he ain't gonna make it into the UFC, maybe past another fight or two. He's a world champ with a title defense now. Yeah, that, that, that gym was something else. I think Nolan King was on an airplane that kind of resembled that last night, but uh, look, man, look. What Sean O'Malley did Saturday was pretty amazing. I mean, people are always going to underestimate this guy because of the path that he took. You know, obviously the UFC, he's he's one of their favorites, and they treat him accordingly. But wins like the last one over Aljamain Sterling, um, the one that he had Saturday night, that's what starts to kind of erase that in people's minds. You know, Sean continues to improve his game from fight to fight. And they're not like little, little jumps. They're big leaps, man. He looks really good. And so I have to imagine that, we're probably going to see that again going forward. But the guy in front of him, Rab Devalishvili, that's just so difficult, you know, because to start off, if you look at the, the Marlon Vera fight, Sean's striking is so crisp, right? It looks so great. But you can do that when you don't have that threat of the takedown, right? Now you can really step into your punches. You could, you're a lot lighter on your feet. Once that threat is there, you can't really operate that way. I'm not going to say that his striking is going to look terrible from one fight to the next, but it's probably not going to be as crisp, crisp and sharp as it was against Marlon Vera with Morab and the threat of that takedown. Things are going to kind of change for him a little bit. Um, so this fight, it, it, it's brutal. The division's brutal. It's not so much that I'm taking shots at Sean O'Malley that he can't do it. Just about anyone, it's going to be difficult to put together three, four fights uh, wins in a row that's hard to ask out of this division and uh the pace that sean o'malley's keeping seems pretty good I i'm pretty impressed at everything he's been able to do 
if he gets past this next fight, which has to be Murab Devalishvili, then I think he ha probably has a better chance of doing it. But the first roadblock is is probably the biggest. Yeah, and you know, John, I feel like a dweeb for almost focusing on can this guy be a great or not because it is a rough road, and I know you're going to cover that. But before that, maybe talk about just what a great title fight and title defense it was, and then maybe blend into that question that I asked. we got to give this guy his flowers. He looked great on Saturday. Well, I, you said one thing, and I'm going to point it out you know, for everyone right now. It's the fifth round that tells me everything I need to know about Sean O'Malley because he had won four rounds in a row straight, and his trainer, Tim Welsh, comes out between the fourth and fifth round and says, hey, you're doing great. Just, you know what, just stay away from him. You don't have to do anything. You've got this in the bag. And he basically tells Sean to go into a prevent. Go into prevent defense. To, you, know, you don't have to do anything. Sean O'Malley did not do that. He went after Cheeto. And he put a beautiful round together, which tells me the dude does not take the foot off the gas. And he put on an absolutely impressive performance. He is in the toughest, in my opinion, the Bantamweight division is the most stacked division across MMA. It has just killers because you have to be good at everything to be in you know, consideration for the top 10. These guys are just unbelievable. They can do it all and they do it all well. I can understand why everyone's sitting there looking at Marab and saying that is a stylistic nightmare for Sean O'Malley. It is. It's his worst. You know, If you're going to look at it, that's the guy that he's got the best chance. But you can also take a look at, I would love to see the matchup of Corey Sanhagen going up against Sean O'Malley. I would love to see Umar Nurmagomedov go up against Sean O'Malley. And that's what makes it so hard for him to hold on that title. The other part is, where is Sean O'Malley's mind at? Because as soon as he got done with Cheeto, he's calling out the featherweight champion in Ilya. And, and I understand why he's doing that. That's a target. And that's a great thing for Sean O'Malley because it's as a champion, you don't have that target to put on someone that you're going after him. They have it to put on you. So he's trying to create that target, but he's going to have to go through the guys in his weight division. And it's going to be very tough to go through those guys without someone coming out on top. Yep. And we actually have an audio clip of that call out of Ilya Taporia. Let's go to that. Cold coffee, hook us up. Give me a jet to Spain, baby. I'm coming for Ilya Taporia. And if he doesn't want it, I'll... Nah, f it. I want Ilya, baby. Give me Ilya. Why does that fight excite you so much? It's, he's a scary f dude. Ilya excites me. Going up a weight class excites me. But I'm honestly, I'm here for whatever. If you guys want me to knock out Marab, I'll do that too. But Ilya's an exciting fight for the people. Well, Sean, congratulations on an absolutely spectacular performance. It was an honor calling your fight. I love how he says, give me that jet to Spain. And he doesn't mention money or... Any of the other stuff that a lot of fighters gravitate towards that sometimes turn off fans a little bit. He just says, I want a tough challenge. Man, respect to the champ for that comment. That was uh, tremendous there. Uh, great stuff, guys. Uh, I can't say enough about, about what O'Malley did on Saturday night. I do want to say a couple things. I saw a guy pointing out. I may have said Aljamain Stewart. Sorry, Aljamain <laughs> Sterling. Sterling. But I know I didn't make the mistake of the Ultimate Fighter. It was called the Ultimate Fighter Gym. I know he wasn't on the Ultimate Fighter. It was Dana White Contender Series, so I won't take any heat on that one. Guys, let's go back around the horn one more time, though. This is a big fight to talk about. The main event at UFC 299, Sean O'Malley defending his title against Marlon Vera. What's the criteria that O'Malley might meet, uh, must meet, Nolan, for you personally, before even jumping to challenge the featherweight champion? Is it an amount of title defenses or is it just something else that tells you now you can go and leave your division behind and, and become even greater? Uh, I think title defense is certainly strengthened it. But for me, it's always who else is in your division, right? Like if you hit a point in time where you, there's a lull or there's rematches, I think that's when a champion can start looking at other divisions. But when you have look at a thriving division full of fresh matchups and, and really hungry um, title challenger worthy opposition in your division, um, I think it, it it would be such a disservice to 135 pounds and all those fighters for you to, to put the division on pause. And the same thing with Ilya at 145. You know, you'd be essentially clogging up two divisions that are really strong right now. So for me, title defense is strengthening your argument, but really it's where the division's at and, and kind of who's around you. 
How about you, Goes? You got any criteria that must be met before a champ can move up or down? Yeah, I mean, I think it is clearing out your division. There was a time where I think champ champ uh, was big, right? There weren't too many of them. Now there was, there's so many of them that have accomplished that, that it's just kind of dropped a little bit, in my opinion. The road to, to getting to that hasn't been as long for other people. So when people are talking about who are the greatest Bantamweights of all time 10 years from now, the first thing you got to look at are title defenses. So it just depends as a fighter, like what do you want to be remembered for, right? For me, I think you're in your prime, do as much as you can in your division, completely wipe that out and claim that best Bantamweight of all time and then look up. And if I'm Taporia, I mean, other than money, I don't really get that call out either because what does that do for you? I mean, we all remember being in high school, right? When you were a junior and a senior, if a freshman challenged you to a fight and you mopped the floor with them, you're not going to celebrate. That's what you're supposed to do. This guy's smaller than you. He's coming up and he's fighting the best guy in one, at 145. It doesn't really do that much for you. Um, maybe you'll get a, a nice little paycheck, but if I'm him, I kind of concentrate on what I have. And if anything, I look up, not down. What if that freshman had a hot girlfriend and she went, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, you only have so much time man once you go to college that's not too cool to go yeah my girlfriend the sophomore will be out later let's go pick her up like that that's a good a point well. plus there's that number 18 there that dividing thing that can get people in trouble <laughs> yeah. john uh what about you man like you've been around the sport in so many ways does it really behoove like Go said a lot of them have done it now but is that is there really something special to it here's why we did the 30 greatest fighters in ufc history when the ufc got to 30 years last year all the guys at the top um they, they didn't have that champ champ status other than gs well I, I take it back i guess jones had just gotten it but yeah. it wasn't it wasn't those uh, those accomplishments the win over bisping and uh the, the win over who do you mean sarogan it, it wasn't what put them at one and two it was the greatness that came from title defenses and owning a division what are your thoughts on all this no i think you said it exactly right you said what i was going to talk about is Alexander Volkanovsky is the, the latest rendition of let's put a champ against a champ. He did it going against Makachev, who just won the title. But yeah. it was Volkanovsky that did the work that made it to where you say he deserves that. He went through everyone in the featherweight division at that time, basically, and put himself in that position where you could say, I don't want to see the rematch. I want to see him fight someone that's going to challenge him. John Jones did the same thing forever. You know, everything was in light heavyweight. No one could beat him. You take a look at George St. Pierre. He was in a, a welterweight and then retired, but came back to fight Bisping as a middleweight. And you go, it makes sense. I like that call. When you take a look at what it takes for me to have a champion face another champion is, has that champion gone through everybody within reason that you could say that person could beat him? That person is a challenge in their own weight class. You've, you've done that. You've beat them. And I say, okay, let's go after the other champion. 